Good morning, Crosspoint. Good to see you today. Happy, oh, it's not Easter anymore. You know, I, I was joking with somebody in the back. Uh, today, churches all across America, maybe even the world, are wondering, what happened to our Easter crowd? And we were so crowded. And uh, it, what it reminds me of is we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do to be able to show people that that relationship with Jesus, that ongoing relationship, not just Christmas, Easter, and maybe one other, uh, is a real thing. And so let's, uh, let's pour that into the folks that we invited last week who were here. We sat next to, shoulder to shoulder, uh, to let them know that this ongoing relationship with Jesus is everything. Amen? Amen. I know you know that. I'm not sure why so many of my favorite sermon illustrations come from movies. I just really like movies. Anybody else like movies? That's my favorite. And uh, Wendy and I, our favorite date was always going to the movies. We really liked it. And one of those, in fact, maybe her favorite too, was Indiana Jones. You remember that one? They had three of those. I guess that's called a trilogy. The one in the middle was maybe the weakest of the three. It was called The Last Crusade. I see some heads nodding already. Yeah, that was kind of weak. But there was a little part in there that kind of gives me uh, a start to where we are today in the book of Galatians. We're going to start a series out of this book today. And in chapter 1, that was your homework, it kind of gives us an idea of choosing. Let's run that, Cal, and see what, see what it says. You remember this scene? Yeah. Do I look like that guy a little bit? <laughs> I'm not a historian. <laughs> I have no idea what it looks like. Which one is it? Let me choose. Like a doctor. I told the first service, I'll tell you too, guys, never let the girl choose. I paused the video there because you don't want to see what happened next. If you remember the movie, you don't want to see this. King of Kings. He chose poorly. But I'll tell you what, there was a lot of truth in that. It was a, a, a choice of eternal life. Eternal life or eternal death. Our choices make a difference in life. They really do. And the church in Galatia, they were facing a, a big issue. They were facing a choice that they had to make. And it was going to be a matter of life and death. It would be eternal life or it would be eternal death. So Paul writes to that church. So if you did your homework, you read chapter 1, I want to start in verse 10. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. What's that mean? It means Paul made a choice between Jesus and something else. And Jesus what? It also means that we have to make a choice. A choice to please Jesus or a choice to please the world. I like the way 1 John 2 and verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you have to make a choice. The thing about making a choice is if you vote for something, it automatically means you're voting against the other thing, right? Right? I vote for this, and so I'm against that. Jesus said this in Matthew in chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and then despise the other. 
And so remember for the most part that all of Paul's letters seem to be addressing, when he writes to a church, it's addressing something that has gone astray. The church needs a little correcting. And the churches at Galatia were pretty much, this was their problem, uncircumcised Gentiles, or at least you would think it's their problem, because in that church were a lot of circumcised Jews who became Christians as well. And they tried to tell the people at Galatia that you can't be a Christian until you do what we did and you become circumcised. In other words, you had to become a Jew first and then you could become a Christian. I, I just can't imagine how they didn't remember what happened back in the book of Acts and the church in Antioch. You remember what happened there? It's the same issue that was coming up. In chapter 11, it says the leaders of the Jerusalem church sent delegates up to Antioch to let them know that, that they were every bit as Christian as those people who were trying to tell them they weren't Christian because they weren't circumcised yet. Acts 11:26. 26, for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. First at Antioch, a predominantly Gentile uh, community, but first they were called Christians at Antioch. Yet this church in Galatia was trying to add to the plan of salvation all over again. They were ignoring what they might have learned at Antioch. They were ignoring what was the truth of the original gospel. They were requiring circumcision when we know, and the plan was, had nothing to do with circumcision at all. Paul says it more succinctly in Galatians 3. I brought you verse 27 last week. You remember, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. But then it continues in the next verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all, you are all one in Christ. So Paul is saying you have to make a choice. You can choose God's way of being saved or you can listen to somebody else's way. You've got to make a choice. But you have to understand this. God's way is the only way that will work. It's the only way. That doesn't sit too well with a lot of people. I don't blame them. I don't know that I'm all that comfortable with the idea that there is only one way. But that's exactly what Scripture says. It says there is only one way. And so Paul wrote in verse, verse 8 here in Galatians 1. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Wow. As, as we have already said, so now I say again, if you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be, there it is again, eternally condemned. It's saying there are false teachers out there. Let them be eternally condemned. There are people who will try to get you to accept another gospel. Let them be eternally condemned. There are those people who teach a gospel that is contrary to what Paul preached. Let them be eternally condemned. And what does that mean, to be eternally condemned? You and I can't do that. Only God can do that. Only the eternal God can eternally condemn. But I want you to get this. This is serious stuff. This isn't just kind of some theological dispute about, you know, what do angels look like? I don't know. I mean, we could argue about that all we like. We could argue or discuss. What do the end times look like? You know, how's it all going to unfold? I, I believe that there's as many opinions about that that there are people who have opinions. <laughs> it's amazing to me. But listen, this thing about this disagreement they were having about what constitutes God's plan of salvation, there is simply no greater need for theological understanding and agreement than what God has established as this whole idea of the plan of salvation is his bridge for us to him. That's the bridge. We have to be in agreement with that. I, I, I think we have to pay special attention to that, and, and hopefully we do. And so the Galatians, they were dabbling in a teaching which contradicted what had been taught from the beginning, and, and this is a false teaching, and it was distorting the message of Christ on the cross. And it's been going on ever since the beginning of Christianity. It's still going on today. 
You have people dabbling in all these different ideas, theological, about the plan of salvation. Doesn't make sense to me. Basically, the Galatians were allowing an alternative gospel that said this. When you step back from it, this is what it said. If I just follow the right set of rules, then I'll be okay with God. If I just follow the right set of rules, they believe that those rules could be summed up in what the Old Testament law books gave them. They believe that if you could just obey enough of the, of the rules of the Old Testament, then you're a shoe in There's just no way God can keep you out because, check, I hit all the boxes. God, you got to let me in. And only people who did everything right will make it inside the gate or inside the door. Making sure people were circumcised was just a small part of what they believed. But that's how they got their foot in the door. Listen, I know that it's hard to give up old habits. The older I get, the harder I recognize that is. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's true. We're built that way. And so I don't want to be too hard on the Galatian Jews because they were only following what felt right to them. You ever heard this phrase? We've always done it that way. That's a church killer in a lot of places. It really is. But we've always done it that way. And so, so I understand where they are. Most of them had grown up in the Old Testament law, and it just seemed right to have this kind of, you know, code of conduct, follow all the rules. I mean, it seems like that code of conduct, some, conduct somehow should be migrated into the, into the new way. Besides, how much easier, we talked about this yesterday at the men's breakfast, how much easier is it to have a set of rules in front of you and know that all you got to do is check them off? Boom, 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 boom. Came to church today. Came to Easter service this year. You know, I'll go to church in one other this year. Or I, uh, I don't know, I didn't cuss today. <laughs> Another check mark. You know, how easy. You know what, you, you put all that together, you know what it really says to me? What's the least I can do and still be okay with God? If I want to go by the law, you know, and get all the check marks all marked out, that to me communicates, what's the very least I can do and still be okay? And if, I'm, if I've got that in my head, I want the law. I want the law because I don't have to think about it anymore. I just put those check marks down and I know I'm okay. What's the least I can do and still be okay with God? Nowadays, a lot of people, they don't usually know enough about the Old Testament to really know what the old rules were. So they tend to make them up as they go along. We do that. I saw uh, an, an example of this in a survey. The American Worldview Inventory is what they call it. They ran it again in 2020. It's conducted by the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. It found that a majority of, uh, of people who describe themselves as being Christian, okay, Know the groundwork for this. All these people are Christians, as they're asked. 52% of them accept a works-oriented means to accepting God. That's more than half. Half of the people, of, of the people who identify themselves as Christians, think that if you just do enough good things, then your ticket is punched. Now, what are those good things? Well. They don't really know. What constitutes enough good things? Well, they aren't really clear about that either. But they're pretty sure that they're going to know it when they see it. When they get there, we're going to know it. I've done enough good things. You know, or at least I didn't do so many bad things. And maybe that even counts. I didn't do all those bad things. And so maybe that counts. Paul is telling the Galatians, as well as you and I, that that's a bunch of hooey. Excuse my language. <laughs> I thought of that word midweek when I was looking at this, and I thought, is that a bad word? I better look it up. Maybe it had an alternative. <laughs> what does it mean? It means nonsense. <laughs> and so it wasn't a cuss word, or at least a fake cuss word. So can you say hooey? Okay, you're in trouble now, too. If I'm in trouble, you're in trouble. So I'm putting words in the Apostle Paul's mouth and tell you that he considered the false teaching of the Galatians to be dabbling in hooey. It was nonsense. But who's Paul to condemn? 
I mean, how can or maybe or should we trust Paul? I, I saw an article written by Tremper Longman a few years ago, and he did something that I've seen a lot of. He, he really had five, he called it five common reasons people give not to trust the Bible. And he had those five things. At number four, which I was really surprised at because I hear this one maybe most common of all of the five. But number four basically contends that the Bible is written by human authors and therefore it's subject to error. You ever heard that argument before? Yeah, I've heard it many, many times. Man, there's so many places I could go with that and just show you what the Bible says about itself. And, and, and that could be enough. You see, I, I think there's a word for that, that kind of thinking, and I think that's the word we just learned. Hooey! It's wrong. It's nonsense. Paul was saying so in our first chapter, in verse 11, if you read it. I want you to know, Paul said, I want you Galatians to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And to say otherwise is hooey, is nonsense. Thursday, in our men's study in the morning, I'm privileged to belong to a great group of men there. We were reading Peter's words, 2 Peter in chapter 3, verse 15. It says, our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him, it wasn't his wisdom, it was the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain things, some things, that are hard to understand. You ever notice that about some of Paul's writings? I mean, they're not easy. You have to dig a little bit deeper. And so they're hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. But he's saying, Paul didn't write those. God gave him those things. Paul spoke and wrote for Jesus. And what he wrote were Jesus' words. They were not his own words. They were the words of Jesus. Listen, when I teach from the pulpit or when I teach in a classroom, I, I want you to know that I don't, speak, I don't speak for Jesus. I don't do that. I take the words of Jesus and I try to explain them. Does that make sense? I don't speak for Jesus, but I take his words and I try to speak of what he says. And any good Bible preacher or teacher does the same. My words are not inspired by, like they were for Paul or Peter or James or John or Luke or Matthew or the other writers of the word. I'll tell you this, I'm not here to tell you that I've figured it all out. There are areas of the Bible I'm still searching for answers. I mentioned end times. I believe that I'm not going to figure all the end times theology out until I actually get there. And then I'm going to say, oh, I can't believe it. It was so easy. I should have seen that. But I'm convinced I'm not going to know it until I get there. And a lot of things are that way. You see, your leaders here at Crosspoint, they recognize James's warning that those who are called on to teach, chap James chapter 3 and starting in verse 1 says, they're going to be held to a higher standard. That's what the word says. That those who teach what God says, what Jesus says, are going to be judged more strictly. And I believe that's especially true when it comes to the issue of salvation. I mean, plain and simple. All those other things, well, you could put them in a neat little bundle over here. But when it comes to the idea of salvation, I think God takes that very seriously. Our salvation is why God sent his only son to earth, to live and to die that torturous death and to be raised again. That's what he did. It was our salvation. And so the, of all the doctrines of the church, I can't think of anything that is more important, more relevant than the plan of salvation. Are we in agreement? Amen. Okay. So when it comes to how we should be saved, Teachers and churches should be very careful not to tell people things that are not in Scripture. Very careful. Essentially, if a plan to save people is not in Scripture, it's another gospel. It's another gospel. And those people, according to what Paul said, should be eternally condemned. I'll at least say it's hooey. It's nonsense. 
For example, just going to give you a few, and I could take a couple of days on this, and I could tell you some things that happen within our own faith background, but I'll give you this example. People shouldn't tell people that they can be saved by simply doing good. Got it? I think most people will shake their head on this because they know, but listen, we don't always live it that way. The Bible tells me clearly in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, period. I mean, that really disbands the, the argument right there. But yet we go back to it a lot. Well, he was a good man. He was a, she was a good woman. She did a lot of good things. Okay, I can go along with that. But is that the plan of salvation? Is that what saves you? No, it's not. Nowhere in the Bible do you read that a person is saved by their own self-righteousness. And so if you're trying to be good enough, remember you can't be good enough. It doesn't happen. It's not there. Here's another thing. People shouldn't teach that you can pray a prayer, this might hit some people, and ask Jesus into your heart. Now, some of you are thinking, now, come on, Kurt. I've, I've heard that all my life. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many times, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that the book of Acts is filled with stories of people who became Christians, but not once are any of them led in a kind of sinner's prayer. Not a single time in the whole Bible. Now, I get it. I get it. I understand why people are drawn to this. Why? Because praying is a good thing. Having Jesus in your heart is a good thing. But there's nothing in the Bible that says when I say a prayer, I can basically put in the prayer, Jesus, get in there, okay? Because it's not there. It's not there. I get praying and I get what you're praying for, and those are all commendable things, but the reality is it's not part of the plan of salvation. I don't mean to be harsh with that at all, but that's the truth. I like praying. I like seeking after Jesus. But let's remember what the Bible says about the plan of salvation rather than what we've made of it. Here's another one. This one kind of hits close to me a little bit. When I was a baby, just a few years ago, <laughs> I was in the Catholic Church. My parents had me christened. I don't know how many days. I just don't remember how many days after I was born that I was christened. Why? Because I wasn't part of the decision. I don't remember anything about it, but in the Catholic faith, and I love my parents, they, they were Catholics all their lives, but in the Catholic tradition, you can be baptized as a baby. Now, what's the issue with that? The issue is it's not in there. I mean, you can't find any place where John or Peter or Paul ever baptized a baby, and so that's why we don't do it here. I understand the reasoning behind it, just like for my parents. Parents want to do for their children something they're too young to understand or do for themselves. But the Bible clearly says that we are to repent and be baptized. In other words, it's a decision that we made. It's a conscious decision we made in our head and our heart. We want to be baptized, repent and be baptized. And that can't happen before you understand what repent means or you have something to repent of and so that precludes a baby being baptized I, you know I could go on for a lot of things and I, I'm not here to say that I condemn what other people are doing I, I'm just trying to say what's in here that's it okay and so we could have friendly discussions about it all you want but I, I want to be able to strip away some of what we've just gotten used to we do that in the Christian church you, I, I don't want to go too far off track here. I mean, I, I could really go on and on and on. Does anybody have a story they'd like to tell? No, I'm teasing. <laughs> so let's get back to what we have. What does the Bible say about the plan of salvation? What is it that God wants me to do to be saved? Well, let's look at what the Bible actually said. We've done this before. I'm going to do it again. And I want you to know it. I want you to be able to share it with somebody. Maybe somebody came to church with you last Easter and they don't know this. You're the one that's going to tell them. It's the old five-finger exercise. What's number one? Is to hear the Word of God. To hear it. And so it begins, for example, in Romans 10 and 17. It says that faith comes from hearing the message. 
And the message is heard through the word of Christ. That's where it's heard from. I mean, it's neat to share our stories, and I think that inspires people to want to be able to do that, but they have to hear it first. They have to hear from the word of God. Mankind's journey of faith begins when somebody shares the gospel. That's why we adopted reaching for Jesus plus one. That whole idea of, of reaching, it recognizes that our faith kind of blossoms when we reach for Jesus. And then there are, there are others who are depending on us to share that good news, that gospel message with them so that they can hear it. So that they can hear it. Because faith comes from Hearing the message, that's where it starts, is number one. Number two, you have to believe it. You have to believe it. You must believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he came to die for you. Jesus' cousin was John the Baptist. And man, he knew who Jesus was. From the very first time he ever met him, do you remember the first time John the Baptist met Jesus? He was in his mother's womb. The Bible says he jumped in his mother's womb when Mary walked in. How amazing is that? And so years later, 30 some odd years later, Jesus comes walking towards him again, and John gives this record, and John, John the Baptist gives the record in John 1 and 29. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look! The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The one that I jumped in my mother's womb about 30 plus years ago. He's here. He believed in him. It's a beautiful expression of that faith. You see, only a spotless, sinless, perfect sacrifice could be made for the sins of mankind. And Jesus came in the form of that man to do just that. John the Baptist believed it, and you must as well. Third is to repent. You have to accept that you've sinned and that you want to change. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Godly sorrow, we're sorry for what we did, brings repentance. I want to turn from all those things. I want to give those things away. You know, and, and what happens? That leads to salvation. It doesn't say godly sorrow brings repentance and gives you salvation. It says it leads to. So this is what we know. It's part of that plan. It's right there in the middle of everything possibly, but it's part of the plan. Repenting means you're willing to let go of your way of doing things and allowing God to take control. You're ready to shed yourself, shed yourself of the old self and then begin to walk as a child of God. Here's number four. Confess. Confess Jesus. You have to be willing to confess, acknowledge that Jesus is the Lord and master of your life. Someone asked me recently about Romans uh, 10 and verse 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth. But this is it. I'm convinced that a lot of people don't understand or at least pay close attention to when they call Jesus Lord. When you call him Lord, saying that someone is your Lord. All of you who were baptized here at Cross Point, I hope all of you that were baptized into Christ, no matter where it was, also gave what we call the great confession. I believe that Jesus is, the, you want to say it with me? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. That's what I have people say. I just wonder how many people understand what they're thinking, what's going on in their head. Really? Lord? Lord? I mean, what does that mean? It means I've given up all control over everything. I don't own anything anymore. He owns it all. Everything you have, every possession, family, home, car, all of it, all of it, all of it is his. None of it belongs to you. You've turned it all over. That's number four. Number five, be baptized. Very simple. You got to be willing to let yourself be buried in the waters of Christian baptism. The New Testament refers to baptism as early as John in chapter 3. I mean, it's, to me, chronologically, this is one of the earliest accounts when Jesus met, met Nicodemus 
in the garden and Nicodemus was wondering, what do I got to do to get to heaven one day? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. That's what he was talking about. Just a few years later, Jesus would make all that come true on the day of Pentecost. And so that's in, in John's gospel and the other gospels as well. But even further on down the line in the New Testament, we get the picture of Jesus with Nicodemus early on. And then we get Peter writing in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. He's speaking about the ark that Noah built. He says, in it, in the ark, only a few people ate it all were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you. Baptism, water, saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It doesn't save you by itself, but it's part of the plan of salvation. Of course, there are countless other verses that speak of baptism as an essential part of God's plan of salvation. And to leave it out or to make it optional or to offer it to infants just doesn't match up with the truth of God's word. Those are extra biblical teachings. In other words, they're not in here. And that makes them hooey, nonsense. That's what they are. You see, I want you to remember as we begin in this study in Galatians that it's all about making choices. It's all about making the right choice for Jesus. Jesus chose us by volunteering to die in our place on the cross. And so when we, when we heard what he had done for us, it, it, we chose him. In, in faith we chose him. And then repentance and confession and baptism. And so with that we chose him. And that's the beautiful plan that he's given us. Uh, I heard the story of a preacher. His name was Mike. He told of his conversion to Christ. He said his family was known throughout the community as the worst examples of humanity. He said their parents were irresponsible. The kids were troublemakers. They lived like animals. He said that he, even sometimes they were caught looking for food in trash cans. And everybody who saw them thought that that's just who they are. They'll always be the same. They'll never change. But Mike did. One day, somebody shared with him about Jesus. He heard about what Jesus had done for him, that Jesus had died for his sins, that Jesus wanted to change his life. And Mike decided that's what he wanted. And so he heard, and then he believed in Jesus. He repented of his past. He confessed Jesus as Lord. He was buried in the waters of, of baptism for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. He eventually became a preacher. He even converted some of the members of his own family. He led them to faith and repentance and confession and baptism as well. And then one day, Mike was at a funeral. It was for one of his in-laws. And uh, one of the women who was there, not seen him in a long time, not seen him since his conversion, spoke with him. And she said that she was amazed at the change in his life. And she said she was surprised that, of what he had made of himself. And Mike responded, he says, you know, I really appreciate your compliment, but I really didn't change myself. It was Christ in me that changed my life. It was Christ in me that changed my life. And so Mike made the choice, and then Jesus made the change. For some of you, that's where you are today. It's time to make the choice. For others, maybe it's time to recommit to that choice. You know you made it at one time. Maybe you didn't fully understand it, or maybe you've just re-realized <laughs> what it really means. And so in our time of invitation today, I, I just ask you to consider those things. I'll be up front here for prayer if there's anything on your heart you want to pray about. But I, I hope you'll consider where you are and the choices that you've made as well. Lord God, I just thank you for Galatians. I thank you that it's oftentimes called the book of grace and for good reason. 
because you show your grace to us in so many ways. Lord, today I just pray that we examine what was happening in the book of Galatia and all these thousands of years later that we would apply it to ourselves. Lord, where have we gone astray? Especially in the area, if we have, in the plan of salvation, Lord. Help us to recognize that you built a bridge for us to get to you and that we need to pay special attention to that. And Lord, maybe that bridge is about to be crossed this morning. Help us, Lord. Be with each person as we struggle with the issues of life. Bless our time of invitation. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.